Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, saying yeah, the yeah, best yeah, student yeah, yeah. should be the one who gets into school. I agree. So again, we go I back agree. to the beginning of this thing. I said it's not racist. And now I'm thinking maybe it could be. Here is the latest installment of Change My Mind, where we rationalize our positions on controversial topics. In our last installment, I sat down with Tina to discuss affirmative action. You can see that by clicking the uh, video here. And in this episode, we continue in that vein with three more conversations, including one with a UT and Princeton professor of hip hop. Remember to let me know what you think about affirmative action in the comments below. And more importantly, what are your thoughts on these conversations that transpired here? All right, enough talk. Let's get to our first conversation. Meet Ben. Ben, is it? Yes. Steven, nice to meet you, Ben. Nice Do you mind you. scooching in a little bit so I can, uh, no, no way I don't problem. have to separate my shoulder each now. So uh, I don't know how familiar you are, if at all, with what we do here with this program, um, especially taking, um, providing an opportunity to rationalize our positions on seemingly controversial topics. Uh, today is affirmative action. This was by request here at UT. I believe that affirmative action is by definition racist. Not a fan. If you disagree with me, you're more than welcome to change my mind. Well, I think we, in a perfect world, I don't think it should exist, but we don't live in a perfect world. You know, we have marginalized these communities. We need help to bring them up, you know, make them, bring them up to the middle class so that they can help, you know, the other members of their community bring them up and so that we can eliminate this kind of poverty and quality that usually ties with race. So I think affirmative action is a great way of helping get rid of, rid of that. Okay, so you said it's a great way. So it sounds to me like you've said you believe that it's the right thing to do and you believe it's an effective way. Yes. Why do you believe that it's been effective? Well, I mean, I think those communities, those marginalized communities are moving up through the classes and because they're getting these college educations that they can get because of affirmative action. Okay, so you believe that when you say marginalized communities, I, I, I want to be clear, do you mean Asian Americans? Do you mean simply black Americans? Because they're obviously uh, marginalized communities who are very anti-affirmative action. Um, yes, I mean like all minority groups. Okay, so um, how do you believe that affirmative action, for example, uh, is effective in helping Asian American students? Because they, many of them would disagree with you. There's a lawsuit against Harvard because of uh, the unfair standards applied to them that are not applied equally to black applicants. Um, well, I think, you know, not all of them feel that way. I mean, there are some Let me, let me ask you this, do you think that it's fair, for example, when the documents were revealed from Harvard that on average an Asian American student was required to get a 1350 in the SATs versus a black student who was only required to get an 1100? No, I don't think it's fair, but again, I think it's not about being fair, it's about bringing these communities up because, I mean, the African American community has been marginalized more than the Asian American community, I would say. Okay. So it should be based on how much marginalization. Yeah. How do we, first off, before we get to how effective affirmative action is, I guess how do we rate that? Because you know, Amer you know Asian Americans were more recently put in internment camps and we had anti-Asian uh, immigration internment policies. Internment camps are nothing like slavery, okay? Like, but it's far more recent. Recent, but slavery has a lot, had a lot more of a lasting effect. I mean, okay. internment camps, you know, they were awful, but the community bounce back from that. I mean, more people went, more people came out of internment camps than went in. So it's not, um, sure. but slavery, I mean, that is just scarring for an entire race. Generationally, like even three, four, five, oh, yes. eight generations removed as opposed to internment camps? Yes. So let me ask you, do you think it's right that, for example, an Asian American female student would have to score higher on the SATs to be admitted in comparison to a white male student? I don't think it's right. But again, I just think that's what's got to happen because we live in an imperfect world. Okay, so you think it's okay that female Asian American students have to do better than not only black students, but have to perform better than white Americans. And in other words, Asian students actually are unfairly treated in comparison to white Americans. So you would have to argue, I, I suppose, that Asian Americans have been less marginalized than white males. I haven't seen any numbers that prove that. Yeah, I mean, if you just look at the numbers, for example, at Harvard, and I, I can uh, show them to you afterward, uh, the average scores were required to be admitted into higher education, Ivy League schools. Uh, with Asian Americans, it was 1350. With white Americans, it was 1310. With black Americans, it was 1100. So an Asian American female student 
would, on average, be required to have a higher SAT score and higher performative metrics academically than a white male. That these are the consequences of affirmative action. Again, I haven't seen those. Okay, but let's assume that I'm not lying. Okay. Where would you line up on that? Just kind of how it goes. Okay, so forget about the Asian Americans, the Asian females, they can fend for themselves. So we'll get to uh, black Americans. So you believe that affirmative action is a good thing, it's morally imperative, I understand yes. that, I disagree, but you believe that it's been effective for black Americans, and you said because now we see them having more um, or, or less economic disparity, am yes. I correct? I'd like to hear you kind of express your position, why you believe affirmative action has worked. Um, well, I think it helps them get the education that they need um, to do well, you know, in this economy, I mean, because you gotta have like a master's degree to get like basically a minimum wage job nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I think it helps having that, especially when a lot of these schools, you know, I mean, UT itself has been like, you know, targeting against African American students. I mean, we have a monument to Robert E. Lee back over there, not especially something really welcoming. Um, so how, I, how have they been targeting African Americans? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, well, there was a whole article actually published about how they used test scores to target African American students. How so? I'm not entirely familiar. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm not familiar either, so I'd be interested to hear, because that, okay. that sounds like it should be a national scandal if a university is specifically targeting black Americans. It was in the 60s after they were forced to. Oh, okay, in the 60s and yeah, whatnot. Not, not currently. Oh, okay, good. Um, well, it's interesting that you bring that up. You know, there are fewer... Uh, because you brought up the idea that more African Americans are seemingly um, uh, having better economic metrics. Uh, I don't know if you have any data to back that up, but there are actually fewer black Americans admitted to universities today than there were 35 years ago. Is that percentage-wise, or is that just numbers? As a percentage of the population in total. Yeah, fewer today than 35 years ago. Hmm. So it seems that maybe affirmative action hasn't encouraged overall enrollment, but what we have seen is worse performative standards for black Americans on campus. You know, and these are the unintended consequences, the soft prejudice of low expectations. For example, black Americans who get admitted into a law program, let's use Harvard Law as an example, they're four times as likely to fail the bar exam, even though they've gone to an Ivy League school. And logically, I would argue that uh, black Americans being admitted solely on the basis of race, as you've advocated, uh, with lower academic performance metrics end up with a bar exam, which is blind, there is no racial bias there, with lower academic performance metric outcomes. And there are more black Americans who drop out, 50% of black Americans uh, on college campus and higher education, they make up the bottom 10% respectively because they're mismatched against peers who had to be more qualified to get into the university. Um, and that creates actually a real, a real problem and a higher dropout rate and lower performance uh, outcomes for them. Could you see that as maybe an outcome uh, of unintended consequences for affirmative action that might mean it's not so effective? I guess. I appreciate that. I appreciate you um, being honest about it. And, and you know what? I would like to see, here's one thing I want you to understand. I would like to see all Americans do better. And I certainly would like to see the outlook, economic outlook for African Americans improve just as much as I want to see it improve for you or white Americans. But I don't believe that's necessarily predicated on uh, racially accepting people to college on the basis of race. A, because I think it's immoral to racistly uh, implement college application or acceptance policies. B, the best indicator that we have, or certainly the, uh, the most determinative factor as far as one's economic success, academic success, whether they end up in prison, has nothing to do with a college degree. Do you know what it is? Do you know what the single greatest socioeconomic indicator of future wealth, employment, graduating college is? I would assume it's experience. No. I don't know. Having a dual parent household. Mm. Having a mother and a father who are still together. Do you know that if you, if you graduate high school and you wait until you're married to have kids, there's a 98% chance that you don't end up in poverty. Over 70% make at least middle class or higher. The social mobility in this country is unheard of um, for both black Americans and white Americans. Now the problem, and we see this across all races, Anytime you deal with a single parent household, and Barack Obama expressed this as well, beyond just research papers, the likelihood of ending up in prison is exponentially higher. The likelihood of behavioral disorders, the likelihood of not making it through high school is exponentially higher. Interestingly, from the 1960s, where single parent households made up less than 25% of all black households, in 2019, they make up almost 80%.
whereas with white household, it's below 30%. That actually would explain the economic disparity far more than um, the idea of affirmative action or its implementation therein. And yeah, but I'm not sure if that's the only factor because I feel like there are other factors that cause you know people to separate to have single. I agree. Households. I agree. Um, can I get, present to you my case as to sure. why that is? Uh, it would be actually policies very similar to affirmative action. It would be policies like the Model Cities program under Lyndon Johnson, the Modern Welfare program as we know it. These were implemented in the 1960s that encouraged and financially incentivized people to be single parent households. That's why you see such a strong family household demographic for black Americans in the 1960s degrade to 80% are fatherless households or single parent households. There's an economic incentive with the current welfare system to not be married. How so? I mean, like, because if you How many married, checks you can collect? If you're married, though, you get tax breaks like that you don't get. It, doesn't, it doesn't counterbalance the single household uh, benefits that you would get from a welfare program, the current welfare program. So I, and that's what's so alarming to me about affirmative action, right? Because I understand in principle the idea of model cities, the idea of the welfare implementation, right? I understand there's, this is right after 65, the Voting Rights Act. And of course you had the Civil Rights Act in the 60s as well. I understand that they were trying to right the wrongs of previous generations. But to way the, the way to right the wrong of previous generations, which involves systemic discrimination against blacks, I think we agree, now involves systemic discrimination against other people, or certainly systemic targeting of blacks for specific programs, right? Mm -hmm. And so they created the Model Cities program, they created the Modern Welfare program, which incentivized single parent households, which created more economic disparity than we could have imagined, and that is very closely mirrored by affirmative action. It's trying to right the historical wrongs of blacks not making up enough of the uh, c campus fabric in the past by implementing racist policies now. And it's having very much the same effects of black students falling behind, of uh, creating racial tension and unrest, and actually lowering overall performance metrics. So I would argue that it's not only immoral because it's racist, but results-wise, just as welfare and the uh, Model Cities program have had detrimental effects in trying to right the wrongs of the past, affirmative action has harmed black Americans, let alone Asian Americans, in trying to right the racial discriminations of the past. And that's why I think we need to do away with it. So, just if I may ask, sure. what do you think we should do to right the wrongs of the past against these I groups? don't think you can right the wrongs of the past. I think what you can do is set the best path moving forward uh, toward the future. And we have seen states that have uh, basically done away with affirmative action. You know what's interesting? Some minority enrollment has gone up, some minority enrollment has gone down. There's really no correlation. It's actually been relati relatively evens out. So affirmative action hasn't had that much of an overall effect. Uh, it does seem as though it's had an overall effect on there being fewer black Americans on campus over the last 35 years. I think we need to do away with it and stop focusing on uh, viewing everyone through the prism of lens and view them through the prism of intellectual diversity and performative contributions. I think that would be fair to Asian Americans. I think it would be fair to black Americans. And I think it's the right thing to do. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ben. No problem. I appreciate it, Ben. Thank you for sitting down, brother. No problem. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Ben, everybody. And as always, if you want these videos to continue, please do consider joining Mug Club uh, at louderwithcrowder.com slash mug club. It's 69 annually for students, veterans, active military. You get this wonderful hand-etched mug and the full daily show that is not available on YouTube. Of course, we are not currently monetized, so it's the only way to ensure that this content continues. And of course, bookmark this channel. Check back for new videos every single weekday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Okay, next conversation is with UT and Princeton professor of hip-hop, Raphael. How are you, man? Hello, sir. How are you? Good, Raphael. Steven, what's your name? Raphael? Yeah. Raphael or Raphael? Raphael. Raphael, okay. Like, uh, Ninja Turtles, as most kids want to compare me to. I liked Raphael right as a kid because he had a little bit of little bit of spunk, a little bit of attitude. Oh, he was a wild man. He yeah. was a wild man. And I appreciate red, it. My favorite color is red, as you can see, as was his. Well, I don't know if it was red or if it was blue. Those look brand new. Red. No, no, no. They're not. They're not. They're scuffed up. They're you just keep them looking good? No, no, no. I wear them too often. They're dancing shoes. So okay. Just... Well, these, these they certainly look better than my shoes. So, dancing shoes. So, uh, someone with some. You are a professor? Yeah, I teach uh, dance, uh, hip hop 
uh, imp improvisational approach to hip-hop forms and introduction to hip-hop. Oh, wow. And, and do you teach that here at UT? Yes, I do. Okay, here All at UT. Semester. Yeah. Okay, wow. So you teach hip-hop or improvisational approach to hip-hop at UT? Yes, yes, I, I do. After this, do you think you could maybe show me something? I could, man. Would you? Would you? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm very white. I'm very white. I'm unathletic, but I'm a good, I'm good at some things. Right, right, right. But uh, take my mom says I'm a good dancer, so yeah. we'll give it a whirl. Yeah, your mom tell the truth <laughs> when they're lying. Yeah, exactly. I was telling you the truth when they compliment you. All right, so uh, Professor Raphael, I don't know how familiar you are at all with what we do uh, at with all. this segment. Not at all. So it's basically uh, an opportunity to sit down and hopefully have productive civil uh, dialogues where we rationalize our position yeah. on perceived confrontational issues. The idea is to kind of disarm some, some hot button issues that people often yell about rather than talk about. Yeah. And so uh, today, this was by request actually from students at UT, uh, as a topic of affirmative action, specifically as it relates to applications and acceptance on uh, college campus. I believe that affirmative action as a policy is by definition racist. Um, I think it's wrong and I don't think that it's worked. But uh, if you disagree with me, you're more than welcome to, to change my mind, Professor. Well, I, I initially I was curious about what this whole thing was. I don't feel it's racist and not having a, as much information I'm sure as you do about it to be able to, uh, I don't know, let's just say debate that. You I might just have more being a, a black professor, you know, more experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my, first, my first thing is, uh, I, I, by definition of affirmative action, is is to allocate resources to those who are underprivileged or, or have been discriminated discriminated against from the beginning. Okay, that's already a hint of racism, right? Discrimination against people of anyone based on race yeah, is racism. Exactly. Yes. So it starts with that. Yes. So to even the playing field, you allow those uh, those certain. Um, uh, resources, so to speak, to be distributed mm -hmm. to people who don't get them, and I think everybody across the board now gets a, a fair chance at, at something they're interested in. Yeah, so I, I don't know that I agree with you in the sense that, um, when, when I say racist, mm -hmm. I mean it by definition. I showed this to someone else. I just want to make sure so that you don't think I'm being cute. I, I don't necessarily mean racially negative, but right, racial right, right, prejudice right. or discrimination, right, right? Right, right, right? And so affirmative action in responding, I agree with you, everything you just said, right. in responding to systemic racism mm -hmm. has now created a policy that is systemically racist mm -hmm. and that it specifically either includes people based on race or excludes people mm -hmm. based on race. Mm -hmm. Notably, Asian Americans have been disproportionately mm -hmm. affected by affirmative action negatively. I'm sure you're aware of the lawsuits that are happening at Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I understand where you're coming from and I think that it's a virtuous goal to want to correct the wrongs of the past. I don't believe that the right way to do that is to then implement more systemic discrimination, whether it's against Asians, white Americans, Mexican, black Americans, whatever it is. Um, and I also would argue that it has not been effective in achieving the results that it wants. So even if it's a virtuous goal, if we agreed that this idea of sort of, to use the term as someone used earlier, reverse discrimination now against other people with preferential treatment for black Americans, if we agree that that is morally correct, it still hasn't had net positive results. And in many ways, it's had net negative results right. for black Americans. Right. I can't agree with that. Um, and you you can or can't? I can. Oh, okay. Very yeah, nice. I agree, Look. I agree with okay, good. that a little bit. And I have to go back to some basic uh, run-of-the-mill statements. Two wrongs don't make a right. Right. Right? But uh, at the same time, man, um, there are, because I agree with what you said, it has not made a major difference. Right. It, it only benefit people, a certain percentage of, of people, which then own, still leaves a chunk of right. those people out. So it's not, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't allow everybody right. that same uh, kind of privilege, so to yeah. speak, right? Um, uh, what I wanted to say is, say you have someone who is, someone brought this up, um, they have some kind of disability. Right. Right. Like a physical disability or mental disability? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and again, uh, uh, let's, let's go back some. When, okay. when I grew up, there was black and white. That was it. Right. right. People called you something out of your name. White people called black people something out of their name. It was racist. Um, now, I don't think with all of the things that are across the board at this point, mm -hmm. all the different groups, it's no longer racist. 
it's now what I would call xenophobia. People are afraid of something different. Mm. You understand? There's more than just that everybody has a preference, something that they do not like. It just so happens to be um, that the human being <laughs> comes in different colors, shapes, and sizes. Right. Um, and so they. I think that's true of some people, not all people. For example, I don't think you're afraid of me being white. And I'm not afraid of you being black. That's I should hope not. That's because my character is, right. it says I'm not afraid right. of you. Right. But I've gone in places that create a tension where I am afraid to be in a certain place, right? And not only because of what I look like, sure. um, but because I might present an um, uh, intimidating view. Right. Right? And so, anyway. Um, What's interesting is what you just brought up is actually an argument that people often make for racially segregated schools. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, we see that uh, sex-limited schools, like all boys schools mm -hmm. or all girls schools, mm -hmm. they perform much better. And the reason for that is because they don't feel uncomfortable either, not even necessarily being a minority. For a long time, we assumed it was because black people are a minority and they felt uncomfortable around a lot of white people. But then we found out the same thing was true, even if you had a pretty mixed student population. Um, and people sort of being in an environment where they feel as though they don't have to worry about insensitivities, offending people, or this sort of xenophobic um, mindset, as you, you've uh, addressed, generated more positive outcomes in all boys or all girls schools. And so you have some racists who say, well, then we should just have segregated schools completely. Yeah. And I know that that is not at all what you're advocating. It's not at all what I'm advocating. It's just interesting right. that we take something, and I think we both agree and say, fear of anyone based on race is bad. Yeah. Racists say, because it's natural, we need to implement segregation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've mm -hmm. seen historically. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. this is in my opinion, a soft version of that is what we now know as affirmative action, because it is excluding people based on race. Um, and and I, I think that's wrong. But you don't... You know, for me, man, it's hard to get the whole idea about your definition of race out of my head because I came up in the 70s, I only know one way. You understand? Sure. So we're talking someone who's, um, uh, let's just say, sociopolitical background or their, their poverty level is different, their educational level is different. Right. So for school, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's a lot of things I want to say, I can't get them all out. But That's okay, we, to, you have time. To get into a university, a prestigious university, let's just say here, Princeton. Sure. They expect a certain kind of student in place. Mm -hmm. If you can't deliver what the expectations of that university the university is, mm -hmm. it doesn't work then. Right. right? You you then I'm not gonna allow you into my school because you don't have what it takes to be here. Right. Regardless, of and it's and my issue with affirmative action is it's the opposite that's occurring that's now. What I'm saying. They're so saying you don't have what it takes to get here, but because you're black, we're going to admit you, even though an Asian kid worked harder and got right, better scores. Somewhere along the line, someone said there's not enough of a particular race of people here. Yeah. Now, I again go back to this thing. I don't think it's racist, but I do agree with you um, in what you said earlier okay but and you're not talking about black and white that's right. what I'm talking about okay um, so if you're not smart enough to get into a certain place then nothing is it, the, the affirmative action in that way is only going to cause more problems right for uh, uh, on a larger scale, not only the people who want to get into schools, not not the parents of those people who want to get into schools, but when that shit gets out, you got a whole race of people or a whole group of people who are now who now have a problem with that, and they create right. this fuss about it's not fair, right? But it isn't. And so, no, 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 I'm not talking about the. Uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry, I may have missed uh, I'm saying, I thought you were saying, like, for example, white students or Asian students are saying, well, hey, hold on a second, I got higher on the SATs and did more extracurriculars. It's not fair that it went to a black guy and they make a big fuss, no, but uh, I think the Asian kid makes a fuss rightfully because it's tough right now. It's tough to get into a college as an Asian American right now. But I'm saying if, if this school... If the school says you have to have a certain criteria to get in, yeah. what's the what's the problem with that? That's okay, right? That's, that's what's supposed to be. Well, when I, you start saying that... Um, uh, we now have somebody got pissed off because um, they assume that you're 
your uh, that you had what it take to, takes to get into school. Right. Right. Some parents are mad now because they believe that you belong in there. Mm -hmm. And you just may not. So now this affirmative action thing kicks in and... Well, no, and I believe the problem is before that. So I would like to go back to what you said before, and mm -hmm. I agree with you. I have no problem with a school saying, this is the set criteria for you to meet to right. uh, be eligible for the school, right? I think right. we both agree. Right. My problem is, whether it's white, Asian, or black, when that criteria includes, and this race. And that's what affirmative action is. Affirmative action isn't, you need these test scores, you need these extracurriculars, you need this essay, it's, you need all of these things, and you also need to be black. And let's right. add on top of it, you also can have lower scores if you're black, because right. we expect less of you. Right. And I just had a girl who sat down with me, a girl named Tina, mm -hmm. um, and this is just, you know, again, privileged white guy, but very sad where I said, she was saying, well, I think I benefited from affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And she listed everything that she did. She came from um, Longview, went mm -hmm. to a small school that didn't have a lot of AP programs. She did a lot of extracurriculars and wrote an essay. I said, well, that sounds to me like you earned your spot here at UT. You worked really hard. And she said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think so. I said, do you not think that you deserve to be here? She said, well, I think so, but I also think it could be because of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's so sad. It's so sad that you can work so hard and because other people maybe didn't work right. so hard but got in really based on tokenism, right. you rob that girl Tina of her self-confidence in earning her accomplishments. Right. So I agree with you that universities should out set out criteria. I just have a problem with that criteria specifically involving race. And I think it's had negative results. Right. So so what about the, the idea of just having more diversity into the into the school or into the system, right? That's another way to look is, at it. Is diversity... Well. We want to make a, a diverse program. We want to make a diverse university where every it now doesn't look like just white, Asian, you know, mm -hmm. Latino. Everybody now yeah. has, has access to get into this into this place, whether it's school, job, or what. Equal opportunity was the same thing in a sense. You well, I mean? no, because I don't have a problem with diversity occurring naturally based on the premise of equal opportunity. It sounds to me like what you're talking about is equal outcome. Let, let me ask you so I clarify, so I'm not misunderstanding. When you say diversity, mm -hmm. what do you mean specifically? Okay, if you have, if you have um, your school 90% white, mm -hmm. and, and the only people that can qualify to get into schools are people of, of that background. We need to do something. But that's not, that, I want to be clear, that's not what happened. What's happening, affirmative action is the opposite. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain something. Okay, to now, the okay. Point, right? So, apologies. The university is all white. Let's just leave it at that, make it simple. The university is all white. Okay. Someone says something in the system, some, some group says the school is all white and they need to have more color in there. Mm -hmm. So, the school implements some kind of system that says, let's reach out to the uh, Spanish community, black community, Asian community, right? And mm -hmm. they do that. And then so then the most Asians are scoring or they are qualifying to be in that place. Now the school is white, Asian. So right. how do we get more Latinos and more, how do we add more diversity to the program? So if, if, so you're talking if those people are not diversity. getting, yeah, if those people are not getting the qualifications or the scores that it takes to get into school, then something needs to be applied for that to happen. So the school meets the quota. Affirmative action sets that up. You okay, understand? so you support the idea of racial quotas to promote racial diversity. Yeah, but I wouldn't call it. I mean, I mean, I just want to make sure because you just said quotas. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I wouldn't call it racial. Okay. Because. So what would you call specifically allowing a black person in with lower credentials because they're black, if not racial? What would you call that? Mm, offhand, man, I would just say it's offering an opportunity to someone who would never have the chance to do that kind of But they do have thing. the chance by meeting the same mm -hmm. criteria. So let me, let they, me kind of they, present to you. They, they don't come from a place where they're, they're, they're if, if they grew up in an environment that doesn't allow them, first of all, to, to grow with their environment, to move into, to be surrounded by the thing that gives them uh, a certain kind of knowledge where they can, 
they can learn these things okay. to get into the, okay. the schools. Like we, we, it, yeah. we take tests sometimes. Coming as a black person in the in the in certain schools, we well, you're still a black tests. person, from what I understand. <laughs> we take tests to get. In. You didn't do a Rachel Dolezal, did you? You've always been black. <laughs> right. Right, right, so, right. so we take these tests to get into a certain place. If I fail the test, man, I got to go back. Yeah. But how do I learn? How but that's to the take same thing happens tests. with white people. But how do them too? How do people learn to take tests to qualify yes. okay. them into to get into the place? If it's never going to happen, then we need to. Well, it's already out. happening. So let me let me address kind of your point. So you were saying a school is entirely white. Okay. Um, first off, I disagree with your premise of diversity for diversity's sake is a virtue. I don't think so. I think that um, intellectual diversity is more important. And by the way, that's much more lacking on campus than racial diversity, intellectual diversity. Um, as a matter of fact, you have 40% of all university campuses with not a single Republican or conservative professor at all. 40%. You can't find 40% of any schools that don't have a single black professor. Mm -hmm. You can't find probably 5% that don't have a single black professor mm -hmm. or a single lesbian professor. So intellectual diversity is more important to me. But to go to that point, you're assuming, you're presupposing that if a school is entirely white, mm -hmm. which has never really been the case, by the way. Right. Matter of fact, black enrollment in higher tier universities like Ivy League is lower now right. than 35 years ago right. pre-affirmative action. Agree. So affirmative action has had a net negative effect on black enrollment at higher uh, education. So I don't agree with the premise that it's all white by design. Mm -hmm. So I can't possibly agree with the next premise, which is we need to create X percent a quota of black people mm -hmm. by design. Mm -hmm. I can't because it wasn't by design that there were majority white people. Just like it's not by design that Asian Americans, second, who have disproportionately face discrimination. Um, and I don't want to compare discrimination of, of black Americans to Asian Americans, but certainly internment camps and the immigration policies against people from China were very, very severe. Um, uh, I don't believe that they should now uh, be forced to meet higher standards, even though they faced the same kind of discri systemic discrimination, solely because without any quotas, they were outperforming white people. So an example right now, when we talk about racial diversity, a white male can score lower. So we all go, okay, it should be okay for a black person to score lower than an Asian and get into the same university. That's what people, I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. But the unintended consequences are an Asian female right now has to score higher than a white male. Mm -hmm. Solely because Asian Americans have typically performed well in standardized testing. Mm -hmm. uh, they have done very well with extracurriculars. And you know the reason for that? They face discrimination. They faced extreme poverty and first generation immigrants. They have very strong nuclear family households and a strong emphasis on that. And this is something that we talked about before with black Americans. When you look at this and you go, okay, why are there fewer black uh, enrollees right now in university, uh, top tier universities than before? Especially when you look at the fact that a black female with a higher education degree will actually make more than a white female. So the gap is closed in certain ways, but the disparity comes from do, let me ask you this. Do you know what the single biggest socioeconomic indicator is of it's not even close. Barack Obama said this. Every stat that we have reflects that the biggest indicator we have of whether you graduate high school, whether you end up in prison, whether you go to a good college, whether you make a, a good living, whether you have healthy relationships, dual parent households, a mom and a dad still actively engaged in the household. Mm -hmm. Black Americans in the 1960s had a 25% single parent household rate mm -hmm. or fatherless mm -hmm. household rate. Mm -hmm. Today that's nearly 80. Mm -hmm compared to 25% with white America, 30% with white Americans, and, and much lower with Asian Americans and Latin Americans. That is a startling trend. And that will put black young men at an extreme disadvantage. And a lot of it, so you have to ask why. And the reason why was because of, you know, Lyndon Johnson, I'm sure you remember this, my dad's from Detroit, um, as well the Model Cities program started in Detroit. Mm -hmm and the welfare program, which incentivized single parent households mm -hmm. and was marketed toward black people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you go from really strong family structures in the black community, much more so than the white community for a long time, that slowly degraded until today. And that's a more important economic and social factor than even a, a higher education degree. And we're trying to correct it with affirmative action at university by the time the problem's already begun. And we're trying to correct it with affirmative action, which very much parallels the model cities and the welfare program, and that it's trying to right the wrongs of the past mm -hmm. with systemic discrimination toward the future, people mm -hmm. of other races. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't think that it's morally correct, and I would presuppose that's why the results haven't yielded what we thought affirmative action would. Mm -hmm. I can agree with that. I don't, I don't think it, it, 
did any justice. Um, but now I'm starting to think more about. I mean, it could be it could be racist. What could be racist? Affirmative action. Yes, but. <laughs> I thought you were saying it could be racist and pointing at someone. I was like, oh, no, no, I was no, like, no, what? No, no. Oh, okay. no, no. But it, now, I, when I, I yeah. questioned that, that's what I was curious about. It made me come up here in the first place. I didn't think it was. But putting these things in place the way you're saying it, both of them could stand yeah. net side by side. It is and it isn't, depending on how you look at it. Who are you? What kind of information do you have that could that these things that you can say that both these things can stand side by side and in comparison? Yeah. Yes or no, yay yeah or nay, good yeah. or bad, right? Um, real quick, man, do you remember the study? There was a study in New York where um, the black, white, Asian kids went to the same school. Mm -hmm. White scored higher than the Asians. I want to say blacks were second. So it went uh, Asians, no, I'm sorry, whites, blacks, Asians. Yeah. During the summers over a four year period, the Asians went to school and studied and read more during the summers. Mm -hmm. They were first. Mm -hmm. Two years in, it was Asians, blacks, and whites. By the end of the four year period, it was Asians, whites, and blacks. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, something changes. Mm -hmm. And it could be the fact that no one's pushing, or not enough people are pushing for the black kids to continue outside of the institution. Fathers. It's, right? It could be. But it's definitely, I mean. But I, I, I mean, I, I don't come from that. I, I come from a um, one parent household. Mm -hmm. uh, You're just I, a mom? Yeah, and I okay. grew up quick. I had to, my, my mom was working uh, 11 to 7, 3 to 11, all these well, crazy That's hours. Some very impressive. And I'm sure you understand you're a statistical anomaly because a lot of black men who didn't have fathers had. They didn't end. They ended up in the system, so yeah, to speak. Exactly, dead, locked up, kids, real bad off. I, yeah. All my friends were that way. To this day, I only have. I could probably name about five. Not even, man. Three, three cats I know who didn't go to jail. Right. Um, Let me ask you this. This is a personal question. How much compared to? Because you're a professor, you're successful. You yeah. teach. Did you say you teach at Princeton as well, or, or yeah, here? Yeah, I'm at Princeton. Oh, Princeton, it's and then you teach here at UT. Okay, so hip hop. In the fall, in there. In wow. The okay, fall. so very accomplished. That's not statistically very typical of, of. By the way, not only black people, but white people without dads. Yeah, white people, no, Asian people without yeah. dads across the board. Um, but let me ask you this: with how successful you are, and what you've seen in mentioning your friends who've ended up in prison, which is which is tragic. It really is tragic, and I think there's a whole argument for prison reform. And I'm actually very happy what Donald Trump has done uh, with nonviolent drug offenders, you know, letting some black people free, which was a big deal. Uh, anyway, sorry, we'll get, we'll get back to that. I'm getting sidetracked now. Um, how much of an advantage do you think it would be compared to everything else, affirmative action, welfare programs, any other government program that they've created to try and help black Americans? Would you agree that having a dad in your household who supported you would be a much greater um, factor in your ability to thrive as a child than a government program. Having a dad there who was there for you and supported you, how big of an impact do you think that would have made? I'm not sure, man, because the variables are, are very different. Mm -hmm. Let's just say this, my father's no longer here, but he also wasn't in my life. Right. If my father was in my life, I may not have, I may not be sitting here talking to you. I could have taken the, the route that he took, whether he was in the house or not. Mm -hmm. he also, there's also a job you need to do. Well, I'm, okay, I'm assuming a good supportive father is what I'm saying. If you had a good supportive father who took care of your mother and yeah. took care of you in the house, yeah. how much of an advantage do you think that would have been compared to your friends? It would be an incredible advantage, man. And that, I will tell you, statistically, that's an advantage. And I recognize this. When we talk about privilege as someone who is, uh, whether I'm Canadian, uh, French Canadian immigrant was born in Detroit anyway, to me, when I look back, I go, thank for me, having a mother and a father yeah. made such a big impact. And when you look at the statistic across all races, it's consistent. White kids yeah. don't do well without a dad. Black kids don't do well. It's just that 77% of black households don't have a dad right, right. now. Right. And the problem begins long before they get to university. And so then we implement these effectively racist, racist measures in university and quotas to try and fix a problem that was created by government programs in the first place, is my point. You know, it's the, the unintended consequences the ripple effect 
of creating a real problem with economic disparity. Yeah, now, real quick, what comes to mind when you say that is earlier you said that something was not by design. <laughs> Right. The the if a university, yeah, because if it was all white, yeah, the only way I could agree with your argument is if it was all white, only by design, where they had a policy that said right. only white okay. students. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah, what you're describing right now, if we go back, and and this is this, I can't even get into the. I can't pull from this stuff right now because my head is all over the place with this. I didn't expect any of this. But if, when you look at what was set up in, in, in um, the African American communities at a certain time, this is the 60s, late 50s, 60s, 70s, it was to disrupt the, the, the homes of. Yeah, the, the welfare programs, the model cities programs, yeah. Uh, you know what? That I don't know that it was strategic. I'm sorry. I think some of that was strategic. See, many people make the argument that Lyndon Johnson did it deliberately. Yeah. Do you, you believe that? I do. And okay. it was the, it was a design. Yeah. It was designed to set up things for what's happening today. Right. And there might have been some programs that were put in place or implemented to disrupt that. But here's the thing, right? It was presented by Lyndon Johnson as a gift. Right? It was presented as a hey, we're going to fix the problems of the past. We're going to implement welfare. We're going to right. do central right. urbanized right. planning. Right. Right. right, right. Very similar to the way affirmative action by design is presented as a gift. If something was not looked at um, critically, it becomes enabling. Mm -hmm. And that's what that was. And so some things that are put, that are implemented into systems are enabling. And affirmative action may just be that thing. Mm -hmm. may have some kind of it lingers, man. Yeah. Right? Because um, I want people to, especially, I mean, you, you, so you, what was your path like becoming a professor well, of hip-hop? Because that's, that's not a topic I'm super familiar with, by the way. Well, I, this is, uh, I'm, 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 okay. <laughs> Grew up in a one-parent household. Yeah. Uh, my friends, I sold drugs. They've been in out of jail. Not me. My mother was very strong. Um, and so she, I think she had high expectations of me as a child. I was told to do things and expected them to be done when she came home. Right. That carried with me all my life. Um, and I watched my friends grow up in the same one-parent household with, the, with their mother. When we got into the street, we did whatever we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they went home and they took whatever they had in the street into the home. I left that shit outside because my mom was going to do what my dad would do. Kick your ass. Yeah. So I had something to had a standard to live up to, right? French Canadian moms very similar in that way. My mom <laughs> slapped me around. I'm not. I don't have much in common with a lot of these white Americans who right. get a timeout. Oh, I was I like, "That's it. what you got." Right. Well, Canadians breed some tough cats. French right? Canadians, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, I didn't go to university. I'm cutting some stuff out, but I didn't go sure. to a university. Um, I, I had my hands on the street and very uh, many different things that created character for me. I learned what was right and wrong, and I learned how to decipher between the two to get where I needed to get to. Because mm -hmm. people were watching me. Um, also, I kind of stayed away from certain things that I knew would get me in trouble. Yeah. And if I did get in trouble, nobody knew I was getting in trouble because it's just a street thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, don't have a college degree. Didn't go to college. So how do you become a professor? Studied what I thought I was supposed to study on my own. I read a lot after I got out of school. I read a lot. Um, I was hungry for information that I wasn't learning in school. This, this stuff wasn't set up for me in school. It was a place for me to go to work by standard mm -hmm. and get out. With, right. what, am, what am I supposed to do? Live by what everybody else says. Go to college, get an education, yeah. wife, kid, job, the whole nine. That didn't interest me. I wanted to make things. I wanted that was very creative. Creative. And so I was the same same way. They thought I was learning disabled because I was bored. Oh man, same thing. I was bored, talked all the damn time and wonder why people weren't doing I was in the second grade reading on the sixth grade level. Right. When I went to the second grade, we were bused to we were bused out of the hood into into the white schools. My dad was uh, in Detroit after the riots with the, the mm. yeah that worked like a charm didn't it the <laughs> integration busing system yeah. another example of but unintended is, consequences yeah, yeah but now now with me as a child not knowing where what I was doing where I was going I took to that as punishment for talking too much I was put in the corner to read as punishment for talking too much 
after I read the books, I was put in the corner to write Chinese. <laughs> it's a hard language to start. Mandarin or uh, I don't or remember. Candy? Just any Chinese remember. characters. We were doing we were doing characters. <laughs> so you didn't know what just, you were writing? No, it was just these copied characters. What so, if you just had a really racist professor as you're writing racist sh well, in I Chinese thought, thought, just to I screw thought, with you? I thought the teacher was racist. I did because I was the only. I was there was three black kids. Right. I was the one that was getting in trouble all the time, and I'm like, you're picking on me. Right. So I was telling my mom, this woman doesn't like me. That. Long, in the long run, I completely opposite. Looking back, it was you. This woman was creating tools for punishment that was encouraging creativity and learning. Ability. Turning destructive Better behavior into learning. productive ability. Yes, I went back. I went to third grade, back to the hood schools, mm -hmm. dude. Cutting class, hanging out with the wrong crowds, the whole nine. Right. Um, and I remember that to this day. That's where I should have been because the kind of person I was. So anyway, long story short, somewhere in in my head, that stuff stuck with me, man. And I, I lived by that. I read things that I was interested in all the time. I continued to practice. I continued can, can I ask to you a quick question? Because yeah. I'm interested. You said, so that happened, that pr teacher, that was when you were going across district in the new... Yes. So was that teacher, was she white or was she, she black? She was a white, old, old white woman named Miss Funk. So she was I an said, old white woman, though, who yes. you thought was racist, I thought she was racist, but you realized yeah, she was... On, she was actually doing things that, to encourage me to be better. And then when you went back to the schools where the teachers were primarily black... The, no, they were white, too. They didn't take care of you. Same no. Way. Okay. It was just shuffling these kids through the school to get out. Right. That's it. The punishment was Despite the fact that there's more spe spending in those schools, a lot of people don't know. There's more spending yeah, exactly. in the inner city schools. It's, like it's prison, just... man. In yeah. prisons. It's the same thing in prison. Yeah. So so what did they do when we got in trouble in the hood schools? Put you in a room, no book, no nothing. Yeah. You can't read. You just have to sit there with your head down. Don't talk. No nothing. That's destructive. My teacher, you know what? I have a similar story. Uh, so they, it was in the fourth grade. And I was... Do you care about my story? It's kind of it's kind of Mary, Mary's. It's, sorry, we've got enough, and then we'll get back to it. But what happened was, um, I was forced because in French Canada, you want to talk about discrimination. They actually have something called the language police, where if I open my name is Steve, and if I open Stephen's Diner apostrophe S, I could be fined and put in jail because the French writing has to be two and a half times bigger than the English writing. Even though Canada is an English country, but French is a is a uh, uh, sorry Quebec is a French province. It would be like Texas saying. There's a language police, you have to speak Spanish, and you have to write all your signs in Spanish. So not only that, but if you have a single parent born in Quebec, you have to go to French schooling. So I do speak French and English. French is technically my first language because I learned to read and, uh, I learned to read and write at first, but I think in English, and I've, I've lost a lot of my French. So what happened was in the third grade, I fell so far behind uh, because I was doing math and geography and history in French, right, in a foreign language, just because my mom was French, even though my dad was born in Detroit. Right. So because of some kind of a loophole, they finally got me to, in the middle of third grade, no, it would have been middle of fourth grade, they got me switched over, I don't know, we'll have to bleep the names to this, to, from Monsieur, I think, to Miss, so she was an English teacher. Okay. Um, French teacher was very nice, but they thought I was learning disabled, like borderline retarded. Oh, gotcha. Moved to an English class, where now I'm doing math gotcha. in English, and this lady, Miss, she was, um, uh, I, I want to say, South Indian, really harsh, really strict. Um, I did not like her. So I came from a nice teacher who said he's learning disabled. They sent me to a teacher, Miss who a lot of kids hated, thought was mean. Mm -hmm. But she stayed after class and taught me long division mm -hmm. as long as it took. She didn't do it with a smile on her face, right. but she cared. Right. And she right. basically right. Right. said, your right. child is not learning disabled. Right. Your child, actually, she said your child may have ADHD, but she said it's, <laughs> this is a language thing yeah. that had happened. Yeah. And so it's just interesting to me that, you know, it, it really does bridge that racial divide. It is about actually helping people and wanting to better people, regardless of where they are, or regardless of their race. And that's my problem with uh, affirmative action on campus, is it's not blind. Like your white professor was yeah. raci racially blind and she was just helping a kid. Yeah. Ms was just helping a kid. Right. Affirmative action right. says, don't help the white kid, right. don't help the Asian kid, you have to help the black kid. Right. And that creates another system. It also perpetuates the idea that you have to just do what you need to do right. to play the game. Right. Just as good as everyone else. So, okay, sorry, I interrupted, but how did you become a professor okay, of hip hop? So Were you a hip hop started, dancer? Yeah, yeah, I started breaking in 1983 with Breaker, and I started breaking in 1983. Okay. Um, and, I, you know, 
it was very new at the time. Um, so super long story short, man, I just studied it and I performed in in, um, in theater with, with the first hip hop dance company to put hip hop dance on concert stage, Rennie Harris wow. in Philadelphia. And from that point on, I found something that kept me uh, engaged all the time. I can make music and dance, I can do set design, I can do all these things. And it, yeah. The stage was an empty canvas for me to do what I had been learning in Miss Funk's class. Right. And so, um, understanding that from 1983 and studying it all the way up to when I started Princeton in 2014, um, I just put, found myself in different places that gave me an advantage. That's gotta be, we, I culture. guess, that's gotta be a weird start at Princeton. Like, you know what we need here at Mind. Princeton? Hip hop. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Man. Yeah. So they called me and I said no a couple of times, and then something was like, dude. You turned them down. I did. I, I didn't know. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't have a degree. I Can you imagine the look on those white people's faces? Dean's like, what the <laughs> f? Yo, but I, I, I didn't. I, I didn't yeah. feel I had what it took to be in Princeton. Growing up, I heard Princeton Harbor, Princeton Harbor, Princeton Harbor, yeah. Right. And now I'm here. And even though you don't have I a college degree, it was merit-based because of what you'd accomplished yeah. professionally. Yeah. So again, that's still yeah. merit-based. How right, right, upsetting right. would it be to you? For example, I would imagine that in hip-hop, right, mm -hmm. specifically in the 80s, probably largely black, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. correct? Black, black and Latino. Black and Latino. You know, what if they came in and said, there are too many black hip-hop professors. We need to have more white hip hop professors, okay. and then you said, "But that guy sucks." Well, and they're like, well, "Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> there aren't enough of them, so we have lower expectations because we know white people can't dance." That's the, but that doesn't even have anything to do with it. Now, what had happened was because the schools have a certain standard, you can't go in without a degree. You can't mm -hmm. teach that level without a degree. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of people who had degrees that could study or know someone that they could bring in to teach what they needed to teach. Right. So there were white people or people that didn't come from the background who were teaching those those classes. And then eventually, I guess the schools just felt like we need to get some official, some qualified people in, right. in here to do what they need to do. Um, and a couple of them, oh, Rennie, Rennie Harris has a couple honorary degrees now from mm -hmm. university, so he doesn't have a degree either. Um, but he's managed to do what it needs to, what he, what needed to be done. Well, maybe it's different is. because of the history of hip hop at, at Princeton. But let's say where, where when you were touring, yeah. you, know, you said it was mostly black and Latino. Yeah. It would probably piss you off, I would imagine, if they just started hiring white guys to diversify who weren't good dancers. You probably would have said, man, that's well, not right. Yeah. Because yeah. someone else who's a better dancer is losing that spot. True. But if you didn't do the work to get to that point, right. it's on you. You understand But what I'm say? saying, if, if let's say there were an audition. Yeah. Okay, let's say you were there. And it seems like you're high level, so you probably were in on a lot of auditions. For no, no, I didn't. No? I didn't play that game okay. much. But, but, but let's say. your question, you're right. Yeah. White people got more of the gigs than the blacks did. Example. Because there weren't enough of them. No, not even. Um, it they just fit the bill. Now I would go in. I would go to a place that said the cast, the casting call mm -hmm. would be a guy with a white beard, blue T-shirt, red sneakers, glasses, and a piercing. Exactly what I would, would be wearing. Coincidentally, mm -hmm. yeah. And the person that got the job was completely opposite. White kid, blue eyes, blonde hair, looks like we can put him anywhere we need to mm. put him. And so that is what becomes the visual, I, being, being able to identify hip hop with that thing. And then you, you get understand? that end sync shit. That's what happens. Yeah. And it's, it's still continuing to be sure. that. So for, for but me, I think that, we were finding common ground where we both agree, in that instance, the best dancer should be the one who gets the job. And I'm, yeah, even though it wasn't the case, yeah, and I'm saying yeah, the yeah, best yeah, student yeah. should be the one who gets into school. I agree. So again, we go back to the beginning of this thing. I said it's not racist. And now I'm thinking maybe it could be, a little bit. but with more information, we put both these things on the table and we're both, there's no right or wrong. It's just how can you prove right. which one you agree with. Okay, well, so we both have something to think about. Are you, are you oh, definitely, man. I have, I, I'm definitely going to think about that even more. You're going to show me a little of the hip hop thing? I'll show you. All right, thanks, you, man. Okay, wait, this is the thing. Hold on. All right, he's a professor of hip hop. What do I got to do? So you go like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Just go up and down. Go up and down and up and down. Everybody, touch, grab hands, right? We'll do like this big wave. Okay. Yeah, everyone grab hands. Let's do the wave. Everyone grab hands. Come on now. We're going to do the wave. Let's do a giant wave. There you right? go. We'll start right here. Let's okay. Right here. Hey, we grab hands? Yeah, Is that okay? You got to connect, connect, connect it over there. Connect Johnny, come this, here. Man. Or Jeff, I got my security guy. Come on. My security guy will do the... All right. He's teaching me... Okay. All right, look. All right, look. This is where it's going. There it is. What? There it is, what? all the way around. Look at this. How about that? Look at this. 
All different races, genders, the power of dance. That's called the affirmative wave right there. Your professor wave. Professor Raphael is thank, thank you very much. Man. Thank, thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, it. You gave me God bless you. About, man. Be well. Thank you. Well, look how surprisingly enjoyable that was. I don't know why it's surprising. Maybe it was to you. Okay. Uh, next up, Alejandra. What's your name? Ali. Ali? Yeah, Ali. Ale? Yeah, like Alejandra. Okay, like Alejandra. Okay, yes. forgive me if I don't... A Ale. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Stephen, forgive me if I don't pronounce it correctly. No, no worries. Should I only grab a sip of water before we start? I'm very thirsty. Every time I go to Starbucks, I have to name myself Ashley. So yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what they put on the cup? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mom is French Canadian, and uh, she just doesn't pronounce anything properly, so I have That's to pronounce it for her. She goes, Francine, and they're like, what? I go, Francine, yeah. just put that on there. So um, I understand. Uh, so, Ale. Yes. Okay, I'm close, all right. I don't know how familiar you are, if at all, with what we do with this program. Yeah. Uh, okay, you are. So typically it's, it's... Let me allow this to finish. Okay, that's it. Um, it's a chance to sort of rationalize our positions on controversial topics. Uh, today, by request at UT is affirmative action. I believe that affirmative action is racist by definition. Uh, I think it's morally wrong and it hasn't worked. If you disagree with me, you're more than welcome to change my mind. Well, I mean, I think that calling it racist isn't like, I guess the correct term because it, it's like a policy that was instituted in response to like social inequalities experienced by different like disadvantaged minorities and disadvantaged like racial groups. Um, I, I agree with what, I just want to make sure, I agree with what you just said, mm -hmm. but it's still racist, by definition. You see, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't, I just don't agree with that, but... Um, okay, well I, I just want to make sure where you under, because I understand that what you're saying is racism generally has a negative connotation, um, and I think that affirmative action has a negative connotation because of its results, but I'm using this definition of racism here, racial prejudice or discrimination. Mm -hmm. By definition, affirmative action is discriminating against members of specific races based on racial identity. Now, they might be doing it for what they believe to be an altruistic reason, which I understand you agree with, but by its definition, it still is exclusive based on race. You see, I don't think that it like excludes any like race from getting it accepted into like university. Sure it does. I mean, it, it can lower the pool of acceptance like space that a university has because it designates like a certain amount for different races or you know but it doesn't like exclusively say or it doesn't like kind of like if, if you're applying to UT mm -hmm. you're not just gonna get denied because you're white no but I could because I'm black so my point is this when I'm sure you're aware of the Harvard lawsuit uh, but gosh we have clocks we have planes going over it's a little bit difficult so sorry if I get this really close to your face uh, right now for example they look to accept people based on race specifically black Americans and Hispanics yep. at the exclusion of Asian Americans and white Americans particularly Asian Americans so with the same performance standards or even better performance standards they will exclude Asian Americans based on race yeah well I think because you mentioned earlier how you said that you don't think it's morally right um, I don't I think that it's morally right to kind of uplift different communities that are socially disadvantaged throughout the United States or throughout you know like the world or whatever okay um, and this is kind of a way to do that because people that benefit from affirmative action tend to graduate from college more than people that don't benefit from it so it helps like those people that are educated and that are more knowledgeable in like their area of study than other people from their same race or ethnicity that probably won't do as well because they didn't benefit from it. Yeah well empirically that's not the case. Empirically there are, there are fewer for example black Americans in university than there were 35 years ago. Um, yeah, but I mean the graduation rate has dramatically increased also. In, in university? Yeah. Well that's that's across the board. Mm -hmm. But there are fewer enrollees in higher education of black Americans than there were 35 years ago. And actually their graduation rates are lower. And as a matter of fact their performance standards once they're in college is far lower for black Americans. For example like a black American in law school right now is four times more likely to fail the bar exam than a white person. That's not, that didn't used to be the case. Yeah, but I don't think it's that to do because of affirmative action. I think that's because of like the different disadvantages that they face when they grow up. Like, so you believe that a black American in 2019 faces more systemic disadvantages than in 1969? Maybe because not. in 1969, it wasn't, they, they graduated more. They passed the exam I don't think more often. I systemic. I just think that like, 
even through history, the way that you know the laws and the policies in the United States have been structured, mm -hmm. it just hasn't been beneficial to African Americans. Like you, right after they got out of like slavery, up until now, like just, up until now. Well, not not up, I mean up until like contemporary America, like a few decades ago, mm -hmm. the whole civil rights era and like all of that. Okay. Um, but I believe that. Things have improved for African Americans, like systemically, mm -hmm. but they still are like lagging in the race, like in, in like in. How so? How do you believe they've improved, and how do you believe they're they're lagging? I guess. I mean, because like how we talked about graduation rates have increased in the past like few decades, but that's like a. They haven't for black. Well, I, I'm confused by what you mean for. Do you mean graduation rates in university, or do you mean high school? Because high school graduation rates haven't. No, they've university. declined. Well, that's also because of the economic disadvantages that they face, like in so? public schools. And how like their schools that okay so like less funding to yes public, exactly but there's actually significantly higher public funding to public schools in uh, urban areas for example like Detroit where I was uh, born mm -hmm. right where my dad was raised I lived in Michigan for a long time the average per pupil spending in Detroit schools is I think eighth in the country at one point it was like top five or you look at Washington DC in areas that are primarily black they spend significantly more per pupil in Detroit, it's about 14,000, right? That's a lot more than a national average, certainly more than white people. But the graduation rate is, I think, 20-something percent for black Americans. Yeah. So the spending doesn't work. But I think it, it, it's not necessarily about spending Okay, so it's not economic. Then I want to hear, yeah. It's an economic problem, but not like that schools don't get enough, I guess. Because African Americans and Hispanics tend to have different like problems growing up financially at home. So they won't be as like ready to take on like high school level courses as like mm -hmm. someone that's not experienced like, they don't have to work when they're like 15 16 and why do you believe they face um considering that they're not facing it at school they're not facing it systemically but you're saying they're facing economic disparity disadvantages at home why do you think that is i think it's just because of like how the like structure of like races and ethnicities is in the United States like well, well how I'm, I'm confused and I'm just I'm trying to understand your position because you kind of said like well if you look at the economic situation with schools we both agree it's not an economic situation with schools or public funding that's not the case so you said it's at home so if it's at home it's not structural why do you believe that there are more economic disadvantages to black Americans uh, for example at home because when like those parents grew up and like when they got that education they didn't i guess succeed at the same rate as like other ethnicities like white people or yeah white people and um, asian americans and all that so just like in the past few years or in the past few decades the trend has continued and it's like in it's bettering now but it's i don't think that affirmative action is like racist or if it it's you know what i mean like i don't know how, how I, I don't fully understand but i would i would disagree with you in that the trend has gotten worse since the no, 1960s no, I, I don't think it's gotten worse i think that it has i'm telling you empirically it has for black americans actually the economic disadvantages have gotten worse for black american children than black american children in the 60s or 70s it's worse today they get more funding publicly they have affirmative action at school yes all those things they get more money through public funding 100 percent we agree but at home, personally, they do experience a disproportional uh, amount of economic disadvantages compared to white families or Asian families. Well, yeah, because of, again, it, that goes back to like black people and like Hispanics not having the same opportunities that white people do, like when they. No, 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 that's not it. I'm saying they actually have more opportunities economically. They get more spending on their schools. They have more applications that are accepted based on affirmative action. Do you know why? Do you know what the biggest, the single biggest? socioeconomic determining factor is in the country bar none according to Pew Research according to Heritage according to Barack Obama what is if you could pick one thing that would most significantly determine your economic outlook your criminal outlook your fine uh, your your personal outlook in relationships what do you think that would be I think you mentioned it earlier um, was it single parent households yes it's having two parents in the house well I mean yeah that also goes back to like I guess different issues that don't I mean single parent households like that's I guess individualistic but um but hold on a second it is individualistic but why do you think we've gone from the 1960s which sort of you brought up mm -hmm. right pre-discrimination and, and, and sort of the voting rights act why do you think black Americans went from only a 25 percent single parent household 
to nearly 80% today. And that determines you being more poor, that determines you ending up in prison, that determines you developing depression, that determines you uh, having a successful marriage of your own. Why do you think that, not individually, statistically, overwhelmingly it went from only 25% fatherless or single parent households to nearly 80 and is not reflected in Asian households or white households? I mean, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, like, I, okay. I wouldn't. Isn't that important though? I mean, if, 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 if we agree. Why, why, why do you think that, that happened? Well, I, I can answer you why it's happened, but I want to before, beforehand ask, would you, let's say you don't have the statistics, okay? But I'll, I can offer them to you afterward. Um, would you agree with the general premise that the idea of having a nuclear family with a mother and a father supporting children is a huge influence in their success in life and a huge advantage, okay? And let's assume I'm not lying on the statistics that black Americans have gone from very strong nuclear families to single parent or fatherless households, okay? So let's assume we both agree on that. So will we both agree then that it would be important to observe that problem and say, okay, how can we reverse this trend because that would do more than affirmative action on campus or more than public school funding? Can we both agree on that? Okay, so the reason why is uh, because in the 60s, as a way to, you know, the pen, you've heard the sort of analogy, the pendulum swings both ways, it was discriminatory, so to try and correct previous discrimination, they started under Lyndon Johnson with the Model Cities program, actually. Detroit was picked first because it was the wealthiest city in the country in the 1950s. So, government programs, centralized urban planning started in the 1960s, and a modern welfare program, which incentivized and encouraged single-parent households. So in trying to correct the systemic oppression of the past, they instated a policy which I believe is racist by definition to fix it moving forward, which led to unbelievably negative economic outcomes and socioeconomic outcomes for black Americans, and that is mirrored very much by affirmative action on campus. To fix what happened before, let's institu uh, institute a racially exclusive policy going forward my point is that in the economy at large, when you look at the welfare, uh, modern welfare program, the model cities program, it harmed black Americans irreparably for decades, and affirmative action, we're seeing the ripples of it doing that exact same thing. You see, um, I don't think that like affirmative action caused like that, or I don't think that it's- No, I was saying with, what caused the single parent household to, is, is the modern welfare system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I and, know, but, uh, yeah. but I'm saying I don't think that affirmative action has like ne negatively affected like um, Black Americans or Hispanic Americans because it's given them more opportunities to go to get a better education and get a better job. So just within that, like there are statistics that prove that people, like again, how I said earlier, that benefit from affirmative action do end up getting higher paid, higher paid jobs, graduate more, and tend to do better than those that didn't benefit from. No, not really, economically. And if, and if it is, I would say that the statistics show it's negligible and it's much, much, much smaller than had we not implemented big government programs uh, that encourage fatherless and single parent households. That's my problem. That's my point. Is it mirrors the same big government solutions to prior discrimination on campus and it's only ever had a net negative outcome. And as far as it having positive outcomes, I was just talk talking with Tina about this. You'd make more going to a trade school. The idea that a, that a college degree is a determining factor of your economic status, it's just not true today. Well, I mean, yes and no, because if you want to be like a professional, you know, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, you need to go through schooling to sure. be able you know, to sure. be a lawyer or a doctor. But, sure. but I do agree that sometimes a college degree in like specific areas doesn't really right. like benefit someone. So I want to understand your premise. Let's use lawyer as an example. Do you believe, because that's actually a very specific example I brought up, um, overall, specifically with, with black Americans, since we've been talking about that, 50% of black students right now in higher education make up the bottom 20% of the class. In law, 50% make up the bottom 10%. A black student right now in the United States is four times as likely to fail the bar exam. Now that happens after university, right? So they've already gotten in, the bar is not racist, the university isn't racist. Why do you think they are failing the bar exam at such an, such an astronomical rate in comparison to Asians and white Americans? Because again, how they grew up and how like, since they were raised, they were at, an, at a disadvantage compared to white Americans and Asian Americans. And that doesn't, like, I, I don't think that because they were at a disadvantage, then they should not be given that like affirmative action because then affirmative action does help them kind of offset. But it doesn't. Offset. At the end, it doesn't. I they mean, fail the bar at four times the rate of white students. But not, not, 
you're talking about like African Americans in general. Uh, on college campus, yeah. Yes. They perform very poorly on the objective but, metrics afterward because they're mismatched yes, with Asian American or what? Like that's a general fact. Yes. If you, if, if you talk about Black Americans that benefit from affirmative action, yeah, it's negligible. It's negligible, and it is at the expense of other people. So that's where it goes to it being morally correct. Do you believe, for example, well, sorry, can I ask? A, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Do you believe that it's morally correct that an Asian American? should have to get, uh, like an Asian female right now applying to, let's say, Harvard, has to get a 1350 on her SATs to be accepted when a black student only needs 1100? Yeah, well, do you think it's morally correct that a black student or a Hispanic student faces like racial bias when taking the SAT through like wordings and through language that is used? I mean, it's, it's like both are rhetorical. And Asi Asians don't? I mean, they... So let me ask you this. Do you think that it's fair that an Asian American woman has to score higher on the SATs than a white male? Because that's a consequence of affirmative action. Well, I mean, it's, if, you, if you think, you can't really like measure fairness, or because obviously like every single side of like a political issue or like just an issue in general is going to favor one side or the other in some way. So there's going to be like a pro and a con to like each issue, I guess. Not always. So, no, see, what, let's, that's interesting. Say favor a side. What does that mean by definition, favor? Favoritism. It's, it's not that it's favoritism, it's, I'm just saying that like... Okay, well then explain for me, because you just said yeah. favor, and I wanted to explain why I disagree with you. So let's remove favor. Yeah. You just said any policy will favor a side. So what did you mean to say? I mean, I mean like, any... Sorry, it's because my friend is like... <laughs> um, I, I just mean that like any... Like for example... Um, it's because, okay, I lost my train of thought because of that. Um, so Asian... American, you know, I'm going to give you some hot coffee you can throw in your friend's face? I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so Asian Americans and whites, I don't think that they experience the disadvantage that like Hispanics and, and black people experience like growing up and like, mm. you know, through through their childhood and up until like internment camps, Chinese immigration policy, no? Okay, but the internment camps isn't like the same thing as like but like the experience of, of Well you said Latino Americans. What have Latin Latin American immigrants experienced that would be on par with internment camps or bans on immigration from China, which we experienced for a very long time? What have Latin Americans experienced even comparable to that? I can't well, think of anything. I mean, I'm personally from Mexico, and mm -hmm. like I had to come to the United States because of like the drug cartel violence in in Matamoros. So it's like, yeah, we don't necessarily we haven't necessarily experienced something like I guess here in, in the U.S. But no, like, you haven't. But but I mean like. So why would it be our job to correct the wrongs of your terrible corrupt government in Mexico? Well, it's not to correct their like wrongs. It's to um, to give like I guess a fair chance for these people like grew up disadvantaged because you talk about fairness fairness is also like trying to give everyone like an equal opportunity yes that's, that's equal opportunity i am stressing equal opportunity you are stressing equal outcomes equal opportunity means we only accept the people who perform the best by metrics but period see, i don't think that black people and hispanics growing up get equal opportunity as compared to whites and asian americans really so you believe that La uh, that uh Latin American, what's Latin American? Because Latin America is still, so Latin American Americans, what's the term we should use? Mexican Americans, Latin American Americans? You believe that they don't, that they uh, face, they have faced more systemic discrimination in the United States than Asian Americans? I mean, because I, I look at them, and here's one thing that's really important to me, I look at Asian Americans who are citizens, who were put in internment camps wrongfully. I look at Chinese immigrants who wanted to migrate he, le, here legally and could not for decades. And I look at Mexican Americans who come here illegally and then are granted amnesty. And I see that as a much greater advantage than an Asian American uh, who is not even one generation removed from an internment camp or barred from migrating to the country. Yeah, Doesn't no, seem to me that's very fair. I, I just think that, um, I guess, Asian Americans don't face, like you said, like as much systemic inequalities than like blacks or hispanics because even like whenever you want to get a job or you're getting i don't know you want to like get and you want to interview for like a position within 10 seconds like if the interviewer sees that like you're black or you're hispanic like they can have this bias towards you and you don't believe that, that applies towards asians i think that they actually have a positive bias okay well i can tell you where they don't and applying to college you see but see i know so you were talking about first off 
potential anecdotal situations that you believe, and it's not supported by data, you believe that when interviewing for job interviews, Latin Americans or black Americans might be viewed unfavorably. Well, I mean, let, me, let me just do some yes or no real quick. I want to make sure I understand your position here, okay? Because I want to see where we disagree. It seems to me you are saying that you believe when applying for a job, a black American or a Latin American may face some personal discrimination that an Asian American wouldn't. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. You believe that. Okay. Uh, there is no empirical evidence to support that. Now, let me respond with, I would present to you an example where Asian Americans absolutely do face systemic observable discrimination on a level not seen by black or Latin Americans, and that's when applying for college. It's yeah. not a maybe, it's we know that they're discriminated against. Well, I mean... Is that, that, that seems right? I mean, if, I can't really answer the yes or no question because you can't really like explain what you mean by like yes and no. So okay, on, an Asian American right now can apply to the exact same university. Apply right here. Mm -hmm. They have to score higher on standardized testing, and they have to have better performance, more extracurriculars than a Black American. They will be discriminated against because they are Asian American, and they have to work harder to get into college. Well, they're not being discriminated against. The other like ethnicity group is giving like it's not like again it's not like UT is discriminating against whites or Asians. Yes, and Harvard is specifically. That's the lawsuit. Yes, they are. That's my point. I yes, they are. I just don't, I don't see it as like discrimination towards them. Like I don't, I don't see it as like reverse racism or like whatever. I don't. I didn't say reverse racism. I know, but like it's, it's racism. To say to an Asian, you have to get a 1350 on an SAT and then say to a black person, you only need an 1100, that's racism. See, I don't, I, I don't agree with that. Like for okay. me, for me, for me, it's like also. Can you understand why yeah, I, I see that as racism, I, I, and many Asian Americans would see it as racism? I, I can see the point, and, and like maybe affirmative action needs, I guess, improvement, and like they need it into like a different kind of policy that kind of benefits everybody and not just like ethnic minorities that are disadvantaged. Huh. But that's interesting. How would you implement that? Like what kind of a, as opposed to affirmative action now, which is based on race. It's interesting. Let's well, explore that. What do you I, think would be the best way to do it? I think that we need to focus on, like, how you were talking about single-parent households and, like, all that going up. I think that education systems do a poor job of educating kids. Even, like, in public schools, um, you know, elementary schools, teachers don't, like, they need to realize that sometimes those kids at home don't have value systems, moral systems implemented, like, in their... I guess, yeah, household. So they need to be aware of that and implement. So I want to make sure I understand. You're saying that black Americans and Latin American Americans don't have values instilled in them in their households? No, 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 it's not that. It's that, like, okay. how you were talking about single parent households and um, how some, like, that's a big determining factor of, like, economic status and all right. that. Well, then that also can determine how, like, obviously how kids grow up and whether they have, like, whether they face, like, abuse at home or whether they face, like, emotional, like, problems and all of that. Like, that needs to be taken into account to, like, So, in schools. other words, you would like to see a system where, let's say, a white, I can say this because I'm white, white trailer trash, trailer park uh, kid who doesn't have a dad and has an abusive mother who went to a really crappy school in a rural area uh, should be admitted before a Mexican-American immigrant whose family is very wealthy. I don't think that they should be admitted before. I think that, like, public schools need to change, like, their way of, I guess, teaching, especially, like, in elementary school where, like, the mind of, like, the child can be framed or, like, um, change, like, different ways that they view, like, well, I'm asking about you saying changing affirmative action. You sounded like you were talking about changing it to socioeconomic status rather than race. No? I, I, you still I, think it should be race? I don't think that it, I think that it should be like something more towards socioeconomic status because okay. like that's because sometimes affirmative action doesn't even benefit like disadvantaged African Americans. It benefits people uh, African Americans right. that or disadvantaged like, white Americans. Yeah, exactly. Or disadvantaged Asian Americans. Exactly. So if if we're talking about like disadvantaged people in general, I think that affirmative action should shift towards like the Though not necessarily like you said race, but more towards economic status and right. And so we should have lower standards, for example, for let's say an Asian American or a white American poor child from a single parent household than a wealthy Mexican immigrant from a dual parent household. So you're, different socioeconomic status. We would give the preferential treatment to the Asian or the white person in that case. I mean, I would say so just because they grew up in a disadvantaged way, so they won't have better education than that like wealthy 
person, the Mexican immigrant. Right. Okay. So you believe that we should change affirmative action from race-based to socioeconomic based? Yes. Okay. And then we could look at fixing socioeconomic problems, um, like doing away with welfare uh, completely, so that we actually start de-incentivizing single-parent households. Okay. Sounds, I agree with that. Yeah. We agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know that. I know a lot of a lot of. Latin American, can I say Mexican American? Is that allowed? Okay, because yeah. YouTube says that Mexican is a pejorative. If we, so I can say Mexican American, yeah. it's not offensive. No. So, because, uh, yeah, I, I know, yeah, I know Mexican American households um, are, place a, a strong importance often on family values and uh, have big families and often have mothers and fathers. I have like 50 cousins. Oh, do you? Yeah, exactly. Do they all live in like the same house with like nine trucks in the driveway? I mean, they, we, they used to, like, my mom, she's, um, she has like seven siblings. And they all used to like live together and like when because i'm like one of the youngest cousins yeah but when she had like my older brother that's like 30 something and all those like they all used to live together and so all the all like, the cars in the driveway and on the yeah oh yeah i know there are areas in texas where you're just like okay this is this is clearly a mexican area yeah. because there's like 50 <laughs> cars out in front of this house um okay well i i understand that and i do understand too that many mexican americans who come here and want to work hard yeah have a problem with the welfare system as it exists and i think we would find some common ground on that yeah, sure. because um Often many Mexican Americans don't benefit from those same welfare programs, mm -hmm. sometimes culturally because of a sense of pride and they want to work for it, but uh, there also it could be argued a correlation between uh, that and stronger family households with Mexican American family immigrants. And that's why I think that maybe you see, for example, yourself, uh, were your parents first generation or you first generation Mexican immigrant? Me. Okay, so you came here. So there is actually a statistic, and it's kind of interesting that Mexican American immigrants, first generation, their children do better than with black Americans, uh, immigrants, uh, or black Americans, sorry, even born here, than their next generation does. And again, that could largely be attributed to strong families, um, which a big part of that is, is you know, yeah, that isn't this. Which, which kind of goes back to my point of like, having those, like, because you, you said single parent um, households, that they increase from like 20% to 80. Yeah, in black American yeah. households, yeah. Yeah, and Mexican Americans, like, tend to put a like focus on family values so i think that's also why like personally i grew up kind of very like driven mm -hmm. and i think that 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 like you said that's a very like determining factor in yeah. trying to like institute policies in schools that kind of not improves that but has like teachers aware of like different problems that these kids can face yeah and have like a general way to like teach kids that right. is more nurturing. The problem with it is it would be seen as judgmental, right? And right now we can't teach people that a mommy and a daddy are the best way to raise children because some people get offended, even though we know that would have. Let me ask you this. When you list, because you mentioned affirmative action, and I don't know whether you have or haven't benefited, um, when you think of all of your privileges in your life, and I think of all of my privileges, and I don't mean the sense of white privilege, I just mean privileges, blessings. When you think of them, can you think of anything that has benefited you more in molding and shaping who you are than having a mom and a dad? No. It's probably one of the biggest determining factors. Yeah, for sure. So what I'm saying is rather than viewing things through the prism of race on campus after the problem, let's try and focus on that, and I think we'll have better outcomes across the board. I agree. I mean, okay. yeah. I, I think we disagree on some, but I think I'm glad that we could agree in spirit on that. Yeah. I appreciate So, uh, Ale? Ale, yeah. Ale. Ah, I was so close. Thank you, <laughs> nice Ali. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. God bless. Hey there, YouTube viewer. If you like this installment of Change My Mind, click on one of these other installments playing in a box. It's the only way you can find it because if you search it, it may not show up because it's controversial and, and YouTube wants to um, discourage that. The controversy to change my mind playing by the rules we just don't know what they are subscribe and hit notifications